I want to talk to you today about moving toward maturity. Moving toward maturity. Mike, I see you. Mike's waving at me. You know, every time to Mike, he painted up, up top and he doesn't want to let it. What's up, Mike? Mike, now I'm going to tell the story. The first day, first service that we had, and uh, we don't have curtains on those windows, and I'm trying to preach very first service. Mike walks by on the sidewalk, and he's doing jumping jacks in front of the window, and it really messed up my vibe, and I almost didn't want to say hi to you right now, but I love you. I'm kidding. It's good to see you. Moving toward maturity. <laughs> Look at moving toward maturity. My experience. I want us to enjoy the message. I want us to lean into the message. My experience is one way to look at Christianity is there two, there's two types of Christians that I've seen. Christians who tend to be immature, Christians who tend to be mature. There's a difference. You could say childish. And we all got a childish streak in us, even as Christians. Childish moments. We could be childish or childlike. I'd have to explain a definition of childlike, so I'm not going to go into childlike. It's just, in essence, the idea that we can either be immature or we can be mature. How many people, let's, it's a little cold for me in here, and I need to see some interaction. How many people are going to, right off the bat, be committed to being a mature Christian? Mature, you don't even know what it is yet, but a mature Christian. I want you guys to have this understanding of what it's like to be a mature Christian. So, you could be an immature Christian and still get to heaven. This isn't a salvation issue. You're not going to lose your salvation because you acted, acted childish your whole Christian life. But... One type of person is going to be an immature Christian is going to endure and experience years of frustration. You're going to have frustration. You're going to be locked into a cycle of problems. Your faith is going to be weak. It's going to be times when you feel like you just want to give up over and over and over again. And it's not even because you're being tested at its maximum. Because, by the way, I heard a leader say, if you're ever going to lead, if you're ever going to grow as a Christian, you're going to have to probably increase your, your pain threshold. A number of people I know have been going through some very painful moments, me and my family and others, some painful moments, and very often you have to expand your pain threshold uh, as you go forward in life, but I'm talking about your self-inflected pain. When you look in the mirror and say, okay, I found the problem, and it was me the whole time. The immaturity of it uh, that will go through life experiencing the, just, just the same old, same old, same old, same old, same old problems. But then there's the other Type when you're a mature and you're maturing as a Christian and you experience the presence of God in a deeper way. I mean, that's really what I'm getting. I want to experience the presence of God in a deeper way. I want to be maturing in my faith, and I think you do too. I think ultimately down in your heart, we all want to do this. And actually, uh, I'll point out in a minute that this was Paul's biggest passion for the church. I got some memes for you people. I got some memes, so sit back. I got four of them. We already got one of them up, maybe? Uh, you know those memes you ever seen where the toddlers are acting up and they're <laughs> crying over the dumbest things? So like this, I saw four, and then I got our own. Four, she wanted ravioli for dinner. I made ravioli for dinner. She didn't want ravioli for dinner. Are you a parent? Have you ever had that problem with your kid? The kids act up like this? What's another one? I won't let him eat the cat's food. <laughs> I told her she couldn't go inside the dishwasher. It's a problem. She's upset. I handed her the wrong pink marker. She's upset. Is that my four? All right. So then I thought, okay, we're going to do our own memes. I need a subject to help me out with a meme. I need a, a castle church person who's the most immature person I can think of. I got Alex. Everybody say hey to Alex. Alex, thank you for helping me out. Here's some immature Christian stuff that we tend to do sometimes. Lord, if it's not your will, tell me no. Lord, no. Me. Mm. <laughs> it's not what I was hoping for. When the worship team doesn't sing your song. <laughs> Robinson's like, thanks for putting that up, bro. When they don't sing and you get a, little, get a little immature, God, answer my prayer, please. You wait one minute, no answer. Mm. That's good. I like what you did with the, the pose. Lord, well, we're back to that one. Do we have another one? Or is that the four? Okay, I think that might be it. Anyway, anyway, everybody clap for Alex. You did a good job with that. Uh, but the top priority for a Christian is to be maturing in your relationship with Jesus. 
It's so super important. It has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with the years even that you've been following with Jesus, although experience does help. You could be new as a Christian and just coming into this, and you could actually mature faster than some people who've been living their lives as Christians, but never really breaking out of that immature cycle, the childish cycle. And so it has nothing to do with age. As a matter of fact, mature Christians can be a problem for immature Christians. Even their very testimony and their witness can get some immature Christians riled up the wrong way. If we want to be united as a church, we all want to be mature Christians. It is super, super important. In fact, I think there's a lot of people with leadership potential. Uh, and there's leadership in you. And, there's, and God wants to use you. But because you keep getting stuck in some of the immature things, you can't get to the place where God wants to use you to influence your world. So we're going to lean in on that. But let's talk about it uh, from what the Scripture says. Ephesians chapter 4. I love this section. A lot of verses. Let me hand it to you. And then later you can look at it in your own walk. I love this section. You're going to see that actually as Paul is encouraging the church, he encourages the church to be mature, it's actually his number one goal for the church is to grow closer to the Lord. He wants you, uh, as, as, as a universal message to the church, he wants you and he wants me to get closer to the Lord. Sometimes, obviously the gospel is part of that, uh, preaching the gospel. That wasn't his ultimate goal, was just to share the gospel. It wasn't a textbook, Bible study, okay, this is what I want you to do. So ultimately, you just share the gospel. It's part of it. Sharing the gospel is part of it. Evangelizing is part of it. Discipleship is part of it. But the ultimate goal was that every single individual would get closer to the Lord. Do you all understand that? Say amen with me. So it's to get closer to the Lord. He says it like this. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, I'm not sure, do we have the same? I think I give you the same version I have, yes, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. This is passion from him. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Gentle is one of our, gentle leadership is a value in this church that we prize. It's a way to guard against toxic culture. I will lead with the strength of gentleness. Anyway, he says, always be humble and gentle be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, amen. There is one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. I'm going to get to the part. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scripture says, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Thank you, Jesus. He fills the entire universe. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. And here we go. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be, here's the phrase, mature in the Lord. Everybody say mature. mature. That we will all become the whole thing, is that we will all become mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. He's coming for you. He's coming for me. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. That's part of our culture right now. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever. They sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. How important is that? Speak the truth in love. Amen. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of life, full of love. So that's Paul's purpose. That's a long section of text when you're home, read it. Ephesians chapter 4. But what does he say? He says, I want you all to become mature, mature. 
Christians, discerning Christians, grasping Christians, full of love Christians. Not the tantrums that we go on. Can we be honest with ourselves and admit right away that sometimes we get a little bit childish? Or do I just have to do all the confessing myself? Because I know what it's like to get childish sometimes. So there's six things. I got you on six things. There's probably a bunch more. But I got you on six things that I want you to think about in your life so that you can become a more mature Christian. There's six of them. Let's go through it right now. Number one, it's so important if you're going to be a mature Christian that you learn to contribute and not just to consume. Right? Amen to that? I'm only making you say amen because it's just nice. That makes the, it helps me. It's going to help me today. Contribute, don't just consume. How many, how many toddlers ever come up to you and say, I'd like to contribute to the household? I know I got spaghetti on the ceiling and I just peed on the floor, but I really think I should take responsibility for some things. The house, toddlers aren't going to do that. They're going to wreck you to pieces. But sometimes we act like toddlers. Just give me and feed me and, and, and do it for me and help me and make it about me. If you want to mature as a Christian, right away, one of the most important things you can do in your life is to have a mindset of contributing. And by the way, all this text has to do with church life. So I'm not here to try to help you figure out how to like, just motivationally in your life live. These are principles you can live anywhere, right? You could take Jesus out and people would say, hey, don't act like that. But this is about Jesus. Everybody say amen to that. It's about Jesus. It's about his church. This is actually the context of church. Church universal, not just castle, but you're at castle. So I'm talking to you like you're at castle. It's, it's about how you contribute in church. Your life. It's when you walk through the doors. As you're walking out, it's the smile you give. It's the text message you, you give out. Even though we're all going to go through seasons where you might need somebody to give to you more than other seasons. I've been through seasons and, and, and recently in seasons where I'm receiving and I'm on an end where I need to receive. But it's, that's okay. But the life that you should be living is one of service. Jesus actually, Paul actually says this in Ephesians in verse 12. He says, I'm here, all these gifts, right? People get wrapped up in the church about gifts of apostleship and prophets and preachers, and they just sometimes lose the point. And the point with this was to equip, it says in verse 12, his people for works of service. It's a giving life so that the body of Christ may be built up. Can I tell you, right now, if you want to be a mature Christian, if you want to grow, learn to regularly give and contribute. Maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure what I have to give. Everybody's got something to give, amen? Everybody's got a little something that somebody else doesn't have. It can't just be about what you're getting out of a church. It's what you're pouring into it. And I see differences in immature and mature Christians. Immature Christians are really focused on what they're getting out of it and not so much about what they're giving. So important that we contribute. Second thing that can help you mature, and by the way, maturity is a lifelong process. You're not going to hear this message and just be mature overnight. It's a mindset that says for the rest of my life, the most important thing is I want to build on my faith and I want to get closer to God. I want to put away childish things. In fact, Paul said that. When I was a child, I said and did childish things. But when I became a man, I put away those childish things. Amen? Amen. And so we've got to put away some stuff if we want to grow as leaders, if we want to mature and get closer to God. And so the second one, Second one, I can make a whole message out of. It's the one that, uh, all of it probably, but this one is the one that's registering even with me the most. If you want to mature as a Christian today and begin to live a life where you learn to agree and not just argue. And, and I want to be clear that that doesn't mean everybody has to have the same opinion. We're not preaching in this church Uniformity. I love the individuality that we all have. We are all kinds of different backgrounds. 
And so you don't have to conform to everybody's opinion. In fact, we want to have a healthy church culture. So you can come forward and say, hey, listen, I'm struggling with something. or I'm not quite sure if I see that. You can say it about me. It's okay. We want healthy. But at the end of the day, the Bible says this about this particular point. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to the world or as though you were infants in Christ. He's going to tell you why in a minute. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger and you still aren't ready. For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. Why? What's going on? He says you are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. And doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? Hmm. Huh. Arguing. No? Just sometimes, just sometimes Luis and I might have an argument. You guys never argue? No? Arguing. Arguments. And some of you have probably had an argument on the way to church. That's okay. I get it. This, this message isn't here to condemn you. It's actually to say, hey, this is how we can all grow up together, amen? Amen. It's how we can become mature. But i got to point out that if you're constantly arguing in your life with somebody, and you're arguing, maybe you just need to today grab your partner's hand and say, listen, we've got to stop arguing all the time. we got to grow up. We've got to move beyond, well, this is what I think. That's what, that's what immature people do. This is what I think. This is what I want. This is what I'm saying. This is my opinion. And it's argumentative. And I, and I see that in church. But on the flip side, maturity, this is where I, I hope I can get this across. So important. On the flip side with maturity, there is enthusiasm with agreement. The loudest amens come from the most mature Christians. I don't mean just physically when I say, hey, say amen. But there's an enthusiastic, not mild, an enthusiastic agreement together about the things of God. Mature Christians do that. Immature Christians tend to hold back a little bit. It's always kind of muted. Well, my opinion is hmm, different than this. They sing these songs, like the meme we did. They sing these songs, so I kind of hold back a little bit. I wish they sang these songs. I like Danielle's preaching. I hate it when Adam gets up to preach, so I'm going to hang back on this message. And, they, and, there's, and that's actually what he was talking about in Corinthians. Paul was like, you guys are all worried about who's following Paul and Apollos and all this stuff, but make it about Jesus and make it about Jesus in such an enthusiastic way that you give him your biggest amen in agreement. Amen? amen. It is an am- it's an amazing thing when a church gets so passionate about the things of that church, it changes cities. Can you guys pay attention with me on this one for a little while? If you want to be a mature Christian, you give your most enthusiastic amens. How many people know that our passion and our burden at Castle Church is for Norwich? I need some people who give me big amens on that. You might not even be in this city. You might be living in a different city, coming in. But your heart says, amen. Your heart says, I agree. And I think, and not that anybody here is arguing that, right? You guys follow me? Not that I'm saying that you're out there saying, I don't think it should be about like Norwich or anything. But the point is, sometimes there's this passive aggressive, or there's an immature Christianity, or immature people, or childishness. There's like a muted response. It's like a take it or leave it. It's like, I don't care. You know, whatever. If they want to do Norwich, that sounds good. Don't you see there's a different way to approach that? If you came in as a as a person and said, no, but my heart says amen. Make sure the church that you're a part of is preaching Jesus and not heresy. And once you know they're all in on Jesus, go all in with it. Amen? amen. Go all in with what... I'll give you some examples. Some, some more examples. I'm going to linger on this for just a little bit. Agree, don't just argue. Give your church the loudest, the loudest uh, amens. It's like we have sync going on. Uh, Castle Young and Crown for, what's the age group, 18 to 30 or whatever, whatever that is, and get together. Not all of you, even if you're in that age bracket, are going to be part of that group. But by the way, they get together. We have another one coming up anytime soon, sometime soon. 
And so, but when, even if it's not your thing, maybe you got work or you got kids and something else has happened, you're in that age bracket, it's not your thing. But in your heart, you're not passive about it. There's something when you hear about it, you're like, I'm giving that my amen. I'm giving that my loudest support. I got this. I'm in. Maybe you check in on the person. Maybe you make an extra effort. We do what we do in this church. Be all in on the service to say amen to it. We do what we do on the check-ins. If you can, come in and check in. We do what we do. And, and when churches really mature, there's just something about an agreement. And no longer just being passive. It's like everything's happening here. But when people get they're kind of argumentative, they're just kind of like, you know, that's nice. I ain't against it. But I've had people check on me about certain things we've been saying. And once I pass their test, they're good. But it's not the same as having an amen. If you're watching online, I don't want to forget our online uh, wonderful family. Why don't you type in amen as part of your agreement as a mature Christian? Do you guys understand this point? Can be much more enthusiastic in our lives, a lot less argumentative. And if you're a quarreling person, you ain't going to change it just by behavior modification. It's just honesty before God. Hey, God, I tend to be a little petty about some things, if you could be honest like that. God, I tend to get a little upset if it's not my style. God, I'm not sure if I'm feeling it like that. You, when you're honest like that with God, God pours into, your, into you his spirit, and it causes you to grow makes you strong. And I believe Castle Church has got a lot of maturing that's happening, and I'm excited about it. I'm here just to encourage you. So keep going in that direction. So agree, don't just argue. Number three, listen, don't just lecture. <laughs> listen, don't just lecture. We like to talk at people. We like to do a lot of talking, some more than others. We like to talk and talk and talk and talk, but God actually says mature, maturity is a lot of listening. It's a lot of saying, hey, what is God trying to say to me? What is God trying to say to my heart? Be committed to being a learner. Be committed to not always having to defend yourself. Somebody needs to get this in your heart. You don't always have to defend yourself, right? You don't have to live your life on the defensiveness. Somebody says something, I don't want to hear it. Even your worst enemy might give you something that gets in here that changes your life. And so you need to be able to put down the defenses if you want to grow up as a Christian, if you want to begin to be mature, if you want to get closer to God. Your life isn't one long lecture and what you know and what your opinion is. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just listen or be with somebody or hear it out or seek out what God might be saying and listen. We like to blab at God and sometimes I think we should just be still before God. Say, God, speak to me. I need some help with this. I'm telling everybody about what they should be doing, but can I really just stop for a minute? Can you please help me with what I need? Do you guys all get that? Listen, don't just lecture. Some of us love the sound of our own voices and our own opinions. And actually, in American Christianity, there is a lot of noise and shouting and the Bible says you can shout and prophesy all you want, but if you don't got love, sounds like a, just a bunch of symbols and clashing. And You ever get around somebody, they're speaking truth, but the spirit is just not hitting you. It's not right. So let's grow up as Christians. Let's make sure we're committed. We're going to contribute, not just consume. We're going to be passionate in our agreement, not just argue. We're going to listen, not just lecture. Number four, hmm. Confess your own sins, not just everybody else's. Amen? Amen? Confess your own sins, not just everybody else's. I know we have some issues in that category. It's so easy to point out other people's faults. How many people here know, actually, you might need the most grace? I know I need a lot of grace. And it's so easy. We do a lot of evaluation of people, don't we? Evaluating what they said and evaluating how they made us feel and evaluating. I don't think they're quite... You can't build up unity in a church like that. Just evaluating. I, have a, I teach a journalism class, and we did this exercise where we... You know, I, I have a... One of my classes is about how to tell your own story. So I had two of the students uh, tell their own story. One of them told the story, and she said something, and it hit me. 
And, and, and maybe not the background is not going to be the most important thing, but just to give you a little bit of context, she was saying as a young girl, nine years old, in Kazakhstan, she's on the first floor of an apartment. There's this grandmother on the third. She's living with her grandmother. The grandmother that she's living with says, I want you to visit the grandmother on the third. And she's a nine-year-old kid. She doesn't know. The, the, the grandmother living on the third floor of this apartment is lonely. Her kids don't visit. But nine-year-old her doesn't quite understand. One day she gets a call from the woman on the third uh, floor, and she answers, and she sounds crazy. She something's wrong. Is she drinking? Is she drinking too much? Turns out that the m- woman on the third had a stroke and had died, and this little girl at nine thought it was her fault. It was, she thought it was her fault because she didn't share with anybody the story. But uh, finally, four years later, she matures, She's getting older. She realizes she needs to tell somebody. She tells her father, and her father comforts her, and it just kind of releases her. But what she said was that it showed her that everybody has a story. She says, I thought this woman on the third floor was a crazy lady, but I learned as I got older that she was a lonely woman. She had a stroke. She had, this, she had other issues in her life I just didn't know when I was childish. But I know now as I've gotten older. And, and we have a responsibility in the same way. And, and what this student said really floored me. She said, I think what we tend to do is we judge people by their actions, but we judge people by our motives, ourselves by our motives. That hit me because that's true. We, we excuse ourselves because we know what we're going through. But when somebody else acts up and their actions don't, they, we don't like their actions, we tend to judge it. But we don't get to the motives. We're not bothering to understand why somebody might be acting a certain way. You want to be a mature adult and a mature Christian? Don't always respond to people's actions. Don't always blame them. Also, quickly first look at your own place in your heart. And God will help you as you begin to help other people. Can I get an enthusiastic amen on that? There's a lot of people, even in this church, that you fall into the trap of criticizing others. And and you look at and you evaluate people so hard. I don't think I can, this person. Now, obviously, God will want to give you discernment and red flags when there's even in uh, sheep, uh, wolves in sheep clothing. I get that. I'm not saying you should ignore red flags. I'm talking about basic, I don't like that person. That person doesn't do it for me. I'm a whole back in the church, we are so close as a church at Castle to seeing such wonderful things. But we've got to be a church that first lays this foundation of maturity. And we're not going to be so quick to point out somebody else's sins before we look at our own. And that's what the Scripture says. Don't. It says making allowances for each other's faults. That's what it says. And we need to do Instead of the heavy evaluation of others, the Bible says before you try to pull out the speck in somebody else's eye, remember you probably got a plank in your own. And so it's a good daily practice to say, God, in this relationship, how can I be a better person? How can I grow? How can I be mature? Number five, anchor yourself. Don't just drift. Uh, In the scripture, it says, don't be tossed about like children by every wind of new teaching, not easily influenced by cleverness. You know, there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of misinformation that's online. A lot of information that's misinformation that's on social media. A lot of misinformation that people go. How many people do this? I've done this. If, if it doesn't fit your narrative, you don't believe it. You ever find somebody that you don't, you don't like that person, but you found out they did something good, but you just refuse to believe it because it doesn't fit your narrative of what you believe about that person. And so instead of being mature, you be immature and you say, okay, well, let me try to shift the story. Paul, sometimes people say, why does Castle, we've referred to conspiracy theories and why do we talk about misinformation? Why do we talk about all those things? You know why? Because Paul in his letters, a few of us have been getting together as guys on a Wednesday and, um, um, and we've been talking about how much Paul was after misinformation. 
Things that was introduced into the church had nothing to do with Jesus. So what a mature Christian needs to do is to anchor themselves in the Bible. Anchor yourself in Scripture. Do you know how exciting the words of Scripture are? The life that it gives you? And I would suggest a prayer for you. Father, speak to me. Help me not to abuse the Scripture. Amen? Amen. Help me not to twist the Scripture to fit my narrative. Amen? Amen? But just speak to me. And He will. And He will guide you. And we don't, need to, well, we don't want to be part of church cultures that we use Scriptures to hit people and manipulate people. We want God to speak us through, to us through the Scriptures so we can mature and grow and discern. That's misinformation. Not everybody on YouTube is telling you the truth. Not every YouTube prophet is giving you the right message. And so what am I going to do as a pastor, go around and, and, and swat all the flies? No, I just want you on your own. Get into the Scripture. Get into the Word. If you're not reading the Word and you're spending five hours watching the YouTube, you're going to miss what the Word is going to say to your life. Amen, right? That was good. I thought I said something really good there, Mark. <laughs> Mark's giving me an Amen. Ah, anchor, don't just drift. Number six, we're down to number six. Speak the truth in love. Don't just stay silent. There's so much to say about it, right? So he says that in Ephesians. Instead, he says, okay, no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try. By the way, influenced? We all need to mature because if you're, if you're not with people who are maturing, by the way, you're going to outgrow some friendships really quick. I don't mean like you turn them into enemies, but as you grow and as you evolve, you want to be around people who are influencing you and saying, I also want to mature and grow and get closer to God. And that's super important, right? We want deep friendships. We want healthy relationships. We want to learn these things so we can grow. Immature Christians will hold back, and they'll hold you back. And so you need to be strong in your faith and say, I'm here to grow. Speak the truth in love. Speak. Sometimes there's a place not to be silent, to speak the truth in love. You never hit people with truth just to make them feel bad. You don't say truth just because you want to get something off your chest. It takes a lot of maturity to put down how you're feeling in your flesh and you want to, oh, you're frustrated, but to say, you know what, I actually do need to say something to you in love. And actually, though, the bigger meaning of speak the truth in love, what was he saying? He's saying there's specific truth. We speak to each other about Jesus. We, tell, we talk to each other about salvation and the gospel, what God is doing in our lives. We build each other up in love. We're speaking the truth. That's our safeguard. That's why it's so wonderful to be a part of Scripture and wonderful to be a part, sorry, of church. Church, your church, Castle Church. Cast, wave, wave again to your neighbor. I don't know. I just feel, wave again. These people, these people, us people, all you online, all of us maturing and growing and committed and not arguing all the time and not passive-aggressive mildness and you know they can do them if they want to but i'm gonna do my own thing this church has been very specific about things i think we can get in agreement about we agree about god touching norwich and this region amen, amen. i want you to understand that revival the way we see it and declare it and believe it and i got history and more messages on that if i wanted to but right now just in short we believe that revival looks like people of all races and ethnicities coming in one place and worshiping jesus with all our hearts can i get an amen on that amen. it's enthusiastic and there's a history Going all the way back, some, some of you will know when I started talking about Azusa Street Revival and William Seymour, a black preacher who was, if you got some Pentecostal stuff going on in you, they were fired up. And you know what the reason why they were fired up and the, and the Holy Spirit began to break out in the beginning in the early 1900s? It's because rich people and poor people and black, white, brown and Chinese and all of them got into this one place out west and they began worshiping God and they worshiped. And it wasn't about just speaking in tongues and it wasn't just about prophecies. It was about unity. 
And maturity precedes unity. And in that moment, the first church started, and they were, they were doing really well, and the church broke away, and they gave their reasons, their denominational reasons, and the differences, and the things that they didn't like. But you know what happened? The first church that broke away was an all-white church, all white, out of this diverse crowd. And William Seymour, the black preacher, said, don't you understand? It's not just about flashy stuff and like I said, speaking in tongues and people at the altar crying and weeping and all the miracles. It's because when people looked at us, they saw that we were in unity. They saw that we loved each other. They saw that we cared for each other. We spoke the truth in love. We were quick to confess our own sins before other people's sins. We grew up. We became mature. We gave rather than, con than consumed. And we became the church that God wanted us to be. Speak the truth in love. Can the musicians come forward? I'm going to trust that you got something that you can think about in your life that maybe you need to give up that's a little bit childish in you. That's not an insult. I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm saying, hey, we got some places we can grow up in. Amen? Amen? I got some places I can grow up in when I start acting up. We joked about it at first with Alex about, God, if it's your will, say no. And then when he says no, we act up, right? <laughs> we have moments where we wait one minute and we're waiting too long for God to answer prayer. We've got moments when we're that toddler saying, just give me some more food. I'm not here to contribute to the household. I'm not ready for that. But it's such a beautiful thing when Christians begin to really commit themselves to maturing. What's the song we're doing now? Real thing? That's what we're doing? Good. Can we stand up? Can we sing this? Can I pray for you right now? Um, can you just take a moment in your life to think Maybe nothing is like completely specifically saying, okay, I, that's the thing. But in general, if you let God let his word work in you, it's going to show you some things that need to begin to change. And you'll begin to grow, and God will help you with it. And you'll be, become mature, mature. Father, I pray that you would help us all to become closer to you. I pray every person at Castle. And thank you, Father, for all the people that are here who are growing and growing and growing in their faith. It's wonderful to see. May we continue to mature. May we continue to lead beside the childish ways and love each other deeply and agree passionately and move forward with the life that you have for us. I say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Speaking of agreement, let's sing the song together with all we got. Baby, step my child To you it may be nothing But you make daddy proud Your weakness is only my strength I know you have a question But I'm closer than you think I promise I promise And no
the only one that matters. You're 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 the only.